Hey everyone, I'm Erin Otan, uh, Director of Research Programs at Z Prime, and I'm here with Suzanne Russo, the CEO of Con Street. Thank you for joining me today um, from your beautiful backyard, Suzanne. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Erin. Um, so for before we get into things, can we sort of do like a short lightning round just to get going? Yeah. All right. Um, so are you binging any TV shows right now? I am binging Parks and Rec. I, apparently I really miss the office dynamic. <laughs> that is one of my favorite shows of all time. So um, yeah, you're in for a good ride. Uh, what about the best concert you've ever been to? That's a tough one. Uh, I love live music. So there's been so many that are good, but uh, I saw Lady Blacksmith Mombasa last year, and that was really a wonderful experience to see them live. Awesome. And then what is your first plan, travel plan for post-COVID times? You have somewhere you want to go? Anywhere with a beach and turquoise water. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so we can sort of get into it here. So for people who don't know, um, Pecan Street is a research organization based in Austin, Texas, and your, your office and research facility is an actual house in an actual neighborhood in Austin. Um, people, have, people in this neighborhood have opted into sharing data about their energy use, consumption, and different technologies they're using with Pecan Street. So I can imagine over the past three months um, since you know, the onset of COVID-19 that you've seen some interesting things with respect to um, residential data consumption. Um, what, what, uh, what, are, what are some of the things you're seeing around residential energy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and as you, as you mentioned, we have a residential research network that we've been monitoring for almost a decade now, about a thousand homes. So we're fortunate in that we're able to look back over a number of years and aggregate energy trends over three years historically, and then compare them to what we're seeing in real time now. So across March and April here in Austin, we saw a pretty significant increase in average daily residential energy use. Uh, in March, it was 20%, and in April, it was 17%, um, which is higher than a lot of what we're seeing other regions report, but that's probably due to earlier onset of cooling season here in Texas, although we did have a pretty mild spring. Mm -hmm. um, about 76 of the homes that we were looking at also have rooftop solar and electric vehicles. So we were also able to see a really interesting shift in the duck curve where for a lot of the time, those homes collectively were at zero net energy export to the grid or close to it because we're able to use more of that energy on site at the time that it's being produced. Um, so it turns out working from home is actually a really great curtailment strategy. <laughs> Um, you mentioned electric vehicles, and I know that's one of the things that some of the technologies you guys are looking at is vehicle to grid technologies. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What you're, you know, what sort of things you're seeing? Um, what what you're learning about vehicle to grid? Yeah, the vehicle to grid project has been exciting. Uh, so, in partnership with Austin Energy with funding from the Department of Energy, we were able to install Texas first grid connected V2G charging system. So at our lab in the Mueller neighborhood in Austin, we have a couple of electric vehicles. Uh, we're using the Nissan Leaf actually because it's the only one that doesn't void your warranty right now to do uh, V2G. Um, and there are a couple of exciting findings that have come out of that so far, which is still a pretty nascent research project. But the first is that V2G works and it holds enormous potential to really transform our carbon emissions and also to transform the value proposition that people get when they purchase an electric vehicle. So it's a whole other level of interactivity with the grid and with really interconnecting our electric system with our transportation system to get even more climate benefits at scale. And what we're trying to do is quantify what are those specific value propositions that the utility can get from households investing in electric cars and B2G systems. And then how can we make sure that households receive that benefit back from utilities so that we really are um, equalizing 
purchase and, and benefit of these technologies while helping the whole grid system become a lot more resilient and reliable. Do you think that this is going to have an effect overall on um, the electric vehicle market? Do you think that people are, are going to not purchase more EVs in the near future? What do you think the outlook is there? You know, I, I think just from reading the industry trends, it, it, it looks like overall people are going to be purchasing less cars in general, right? A majority of households are um, in a worse financial situation than they were a few months ago. So new expenditures like a car, uh, are, we're just going to overall see a decline. And so along with that will be a decline in electric vehicle purchase overall as a gross number. But as a proportion of vehicle purchases, we hope that by advancing the state of V2G, by addressing the technology gaps that exist with integration of V2G into the grid across different types of vehicle manufacturers, and by figuring out what are those policies and programs that car dealers, car manufacturers, and utilities should have in place to get the value out of these purchases and get some of that back into the hands of households that will be able to accelerate that market for electric vehicles a lot more quickly than we, what we were seeing before. Because electric vehicles do have this enormous, enormous potential to be an amazing resource for our grid. Um, and so if you're gonna be buying a car, why not buy one that uh, actually lets you earn some money instead of constantly spending it on gas? Plus they're really fun to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can vouch for that. <laughs> Um, so another technology that I think we hear a lot about in other industries and even movies, you know, artificial intelligence, but I think there are some, some real applications for AI in energy. Um, what role do you see AI playing when it comes to energy? Yeah, I'm nervous about this question because it is surprisingly controversial still, um, but I think AI is a fundamental part of moving into the new energy future. Um, and that's because we're seeing, we believe that more and more distributed energy is required to move us into a carbon negative energy sector, uh, which is where we all know we need to be. Um, and there are a number of benefits associated with that. A lot more clean energy jobs, which are good jobs, they're distributed around the country. Um, it's a less expensive grid system to maintain and modernize. Um, but to allow all those distributed energy resources to really work in a way that keeps the grid secure, or actually has the potential to make it even more secure, more resilient, and more affordable, we need to have a commensurate level of processing and computing and decision making that exists at the grid, um, and that provides central operators and the humans who need to be a part of overall management and stability of the grid with, with information they can actually process in real time. So taking all the trillions of data points that are gonna be coming out of households, making decisions in real time that let that load be balanced with supply, and then converting that data into the information points that we as humans need to have to make decisions with, that requires AI. Uh, but fortunately, there's a lot of data that's becoming available to technology developers. The Department of Energy and NSF are investing really heavily in getting AI developers engaged in helping us solve problems in the energy space. So I think over the next couple of years, we're gonna see a lot of really useful applications of AI come into the utility sector and into consumer devices, not only to provide um, more entertainment to, to individuals to help optimize your life experience, but to let households work in tandem with our communities and our grids to provide affordable, affordable safe and, and reliable power to everybody. Yeah, I mean, you said you were nervous about the question, but I think as people learn learn more about AI and become more familiar with the technology that maybe it won't become such a scary, scary technology in the future. Yeah, and we've kind of gone down the rabbit hole on it because we're a data research organization. Um, and we've been really, happy to see all the conversation that's happening in that space around transparency of AI models and the need to develop AI solutions that are transparent in how they're operating so we can identify any built-in biases. And especially when you talk about applying AI to a sector like the electricity sector, which is just fundamental for our society to operate, but 
access to electricity is also considered a human right by the United Nations, making sure that that system and the way that utilities engage customers, the way that they target customers to participate in different programs, and the way that we're as households able to manage our energy use, um, that all of that is equitable and that we understand how those decisions are getting made is really important. Um, so we're also seeing a lot of advancement just in AI ethics uh, and again in transparency specifically that uh, I think are critical to de-risk application of, yeah. of AI into this sector. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about energy, but I know you all also do some research on the water side. Um, what are some trends you're finding around water recently? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, water is more difficult for us to do research on than energy um, because it's harder to disaggregate water use over energy, which is interesting because there's a really big push in the electricity sector and there has been for probably 15 years now to develop software-based disaggregation solutions for energy so that we can better manage our energy within households and buildings. Uh, but because water is so cheap and it's managed by municipalities, as I think it should be, to ensure that everybody can afford water. We all should have access to clean water, right? As much of it as we need. Um, but we've seen a slower level of advancement and sophistication in water conservation solutions than what we see on the electricity side. So our water research has shown that the primary pathway to save water when we need to, when we need to focus on conservation is by addressing irrigation and by helping people just have more insight into how they're using water. Uh, we've done a lot of survey-based research as well with our households to see what do people think are the main users of water in their house, the main ways that they can better conserve water. And it's actually pretty misaligned with the reality. So we have a pretty low water IQ. Um, and again, it's not something that most households spend a lot of money on, and it's not something that there's a lot of data out there around for the average person to look at. So most people think by taking shorter showers, turning the water off when they're brushing their teeth, that those are the right things to do to save water. But really for most of us, it's addressing our yards. Um, and especially if you have an irrigation system that tends to go off when you're asleep, it's probably using a lot more water than you think it is and then it needs to. Uh, so in the water space, there's just a lot of, I think, low hanging fruit still that can be tackled by entrepreneurs, um, but also by municipal water agencies and starting to work together to create comparable water data set so that we can do better research with the data that we do have. Um, and Pecan Street has some toolkits available for that for free on our website that were funded by the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation. Um, there's also some interesting research that we carried out in partnership with Environmental Defense Fund around the energy water nexus, where we were trying to actually quantify in central Texas at least and develop a methodology for other communities to carry out this analysis. How much water can we save through residential energy conservation measures and how much energy can we save through water conservation measures? And it turns out there's a lot more potential for water savings through energy efficiency just because of the amount of water that it takes to generate fossil fuel based power. Mm -hmm. um, and there's significantly less water savings potential like a fraction of your household's water use that you would get by investing in energy savings. So that was good to know because we want to focus our resources and our policy efforts around the most effective strategies when it comes to energy and water conservation. We don't want to ask people to make sacrifices that are unnecessary and we don't want to spend money that's not going to have a good payback, right? Um, so there's really a lot of potential on the energy side to save water, but not quite as much vice versa. Yeah, I think they're, they're both areas where like you said, as consumers and people not in the industry, they don't pay that much attention to what they're being charged for, what they're using. It's just, oh, it works, it gets hot, um, my lights come on, and, and that's about it. So, um, but that's really interesting research that you guys are doing. Thanks. Um, last question. So we talked to a lot of people in the energy space and um, the majority seem to have just sort of fallen into the industry. There's a few people we've talked to that that say like, no, this is what I knew I wanted to do from a young age. Um, I definitely fall into the former category. I was not planning to work in energy, um, but it's always really interesting to hear people's, you know, get people's perspectives and hear their, their pathways to energy. So find energy or did energy find you? Uh, I found energy. Um, 
I always knew I wanted to be work in conservation and sustainability. I have a particular passion for community-based approaches to sustainability um, and actually household-based solutions. So really drilling down into what we do in our homes, which connects to everything else in our lives. Um, I worked in international community-based sustainable development for a while and then started to see that climate change was gonna undo a lot of the work that I was trying to do. Um, and so for everything that I care about, human rights, um, equity, uh, racial and socioeconomic equity, wildlife, um, just quality of life around the world, the freedom to pursue life, liberty, and, and justice and happiness, that we have to solve climate change. Um, and so when I looked around at, at where is the biggest opportunity for me to do that, um, I first landed in green building and, and working with the city of New York under Michael Bloomberg to figure out how do we create green affordable housing. And I thought if we can tackle that solution, if we can work in one of the biggest cities in the world, um, what was until about a decade ago, the largest landlord in the city, they certainly create the most affordable housing on uh, with, with limited resources. If we can figure out how to make that sustainable, um, we can solve a lot of these problems. And so that was a fun project for a few years. And through that work and really focusing on energy efficiency, uh, I was able to backpedal even further into just power generation and overall power management. It, it, that's, that's it, right? If we can solve that and we can start to integrate transportation into a clean electric grid, um, that's where I think we have huge potential in the short term to really not see the worst case scenario for climate change. <laughs> Um, so then Pecan Street was getting started here in Austin around that time, and it was such an interesting approach, a community-based approach to solving energy, which is not sexy, right? It's very technical. Um, and bringing in the technology developers that are going to be needed to get us there, as well as the engineers and the researchers and the policy people, uh, it was just fascinating. It's been a great model and a great ride, and I love it. Uh, and I think I'm going to take your question off the rail for a second here. <laughs> um, but one of the things we've been looking at as, you know, there's a lot of dialogue happening around how the world's response to this pandemic can serve as a model for how we globally respond to climate change. Uh, and none of it's new. We know we need global leadership and policy and regulation, but this experience with the pandemic and looking at how communities responded has proven that point. Um, I have a chart that I can, I can pull up or maybe I can send you if you think it's useful to include where we were able to see, because we monitor houses on, on real time, that once information started to get out into the public domain, that the best way to protect yourself from getting COVID is to stay at home. And we saw about a third of our participants do that. Uh, and then when large events like South by Southwest started to get canceled, school spring break was extended a few weeks, and I think it became a lot more real to people, about half of our participants started staying home. And then when our city in Austin made it a requirement, they issued an ordinance that everybody needed to shelter in place, we saw the rest of the 50% come along. Mm -hmm. um, and we know we need the same kind of leadership on, on climate change that we've had in the pandemic and policy and regulation are absolutely part of that to direct markets and to help people feel certain about what, what is the best way to approach this problem. But also technologies like Zoom are what have enabled us to continue to work. It's enabled a lot of businesses to continue when otherwise they wouldn't have and the economic fallout would have been even worse than what we've seen. And so that's the interesting balance we're trying to make at Pecan Street right now is really thinking about what policy can we implement, can we advocate for that is data backed, that we know is gonna work, that's gonna be effective and cost effective and where there's a huge opportunity for economic growth and then what's the zoom of clean energy, right? What are those technologies that we need to actually let this happen in a way that creates prosperity um, and that creates joy in your life hopefully instead of economic fallout. Um, so that's, that's the kind of the angle we're trying to take right now at Pecan Street and the conversations we're trying to have mixed with a lot of conversations around how do we make sure this technology is equitable, that there's no built-in bias, that everybody benefits from it. Well, I know that everyone at Z Prime, myself included, really enjoys um, talking with you all and working with you all, and we're all really excited to continue following the work that you do, um, not just in the Austin community, but to see what you bring to yeah, the energy space in general. So 
Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you very much um, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Erin. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Take care.